What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Robardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. And we're back hitting you guys with another live stream. Want to do a Q&A, talk about what's going on in the Giants realm of existence right now. Also, just talk about anything that you guys want to talk about. Drop it below. We're going to be a little bit more open in this live stream and just kind of answer any question that we see in the chat. But we do want to talk about a few specific Giants topics, namely, they did have uh, Caleb Williams' USC Pro Day today. They sent a contingency out there. Joe Shane was there, a few top scouts. They also did re-sign Darnay Holmes today. Saquon Barkley is in the media for whatever reason. Odell Beckham Jr. is in the media for whatever reason. So we're going to talk about all these things, everything regarding the New York Giants. But again, also just answer any of the questions that you have for us. But before we dive into all that, make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this live stream. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode. Comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you're listening to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? And... What is your reaction to the Giants sending such a contingency out to Caleb Williams' pro day? I'm doing pretty good. And you know what? Going to see all the quarterbacks doing their due diligence. Um, I mean, realistically, I don't really know why they're going to see Caleb Williams' pro day. We know, I mean, Keenan Allen was there and he's the new Bears receiver. So I'm pretty sure it's safe to say that Caleb Williams is going to be the first overall pick if it wasn't so obvious before Keenan Allen being there makes it even more so. Um, if you're the Giants, you're there for a couple of reasons. I think one to just get a sense of who else is there, right? If they, you know, Joe Shane's there, see what other general managers are in attendance. Is it Minnesota? Like whoever else is there may be also interested in quarterbacks. Maybe there is a connection. Um, also, you can never be too prepared, I guess, if you're Joe Shane. Maybe there was other people he was looking at at USC. Um, I know, you know, Jerry Rice's son is also there from USC. So maybe that's something to keep an eye on. I don't know if he was participating in those drills, but, you know, it's possible they were looking at him as well. Um, you know, when you when I think about the Giants right now, and we know that they already hosted last week JJ McCarthy on a visit, and they took him out to dinner, and they went to the facilities. They said that they did the same thing with Drake May. Um, you know, it's evident the, the the evidence is there that the Giants are interested in doing their due diligence on all the quarterback prospects. However, we know a star receiver wouldn't be a bad consolation prize. I don't really think I don't look much too much into the teams attending you know pro days and whatnot. Um, you know. I just don't really know why they would do that. And maybe you guys in the chat have a different opinion as to why the Giants would be attending Caleb Williams Pro Day. Um, Anthony, what do you think about it? Are you, you're confused why they're attending? I not not confused why, but all but just more so curious as to what they're looking for. Well, there's other players at USC's Pro Day. Right. It's not like it's just the Caleb Williams show. Like it is because that's who everybody's really there to see. I mean, first of all, it's fun to watch him throw the football. That could be part of it. Like they want to, you know, see. And how about just for context, right? Like they want to look at this guy who's going to go number one this year. Let's see how he performs at this pro day so that, okay, what if next year we're looking at a quarterback and let's see how he stacks up to Caleb Williams. So now we have like a threshold and a baseline to compare somebody to, or maybe because they were looking at quarterbacks last year. I'm pretty sure they were at the Ohio state pro day, got a firsthand look at CJ Stroud and even Alabama Bryce young. Now they could say, okay, well, how does Caleb compare to those guys? What is our long-term board looking like for all of these quarterbacks? How do we rank and grade and, and kind of compare all of these guys? I think that's part of it. Again, looking at other prospects there, Brendan Rice, who you alluded to, he's an exciting wide receiver that should be around on day two, maybe even day three. If the giants want to take a flyer on him, that's somebody to keep an eye on. And I think that there's more, there's definitely more players. I, Kalen Bullock, someone just pointed out in the chat safety that we've discussed before. We know that the giants need a safety. We talked about him as being a fit for them. He's there at the pro day. That's important. And then lastly, I think the main talking point about why they would be at this pro day and be at any pro day for a player that they don't feel like they can actually draft is because what happens when this guy is a free agent four years from now? The Giants need to have some sort of knowledge on him, need to have met him, need to have said, okay, here's our notes on him. Here's what we wrote down about him. Here's what we, li here's what we liked. Here's what we didn't like. How did he match up to our scouting profile and what we felt about him when we met him at that pro day? That's what's really important here. So, you know, like think about when the Giants – uh, signed or traded for Isaiah Simmons. You know, there were certain players on the staff who met him back in 2000, and I believe that was 19 or 20, whatever it was, when they interviewed with him and they went to his pro day and all that stuff. So they had a little bit of intel on him for this past offseason when they traded for Isaiah Simmons. It's things like that. That's why they do their due diligence like this on players like Caleb Williams and really anybody in the draft. It's just a smart thing to do. And then the final thing would be, 
you never know what happens in the NFL draft. What if Caleb Williams on the day of the draft announces he refuses to play for the Chicago Bears? Well, now the Giants have to consider whether or not they want to be players in the trade for Caleb Williams. It's possible. I don't think it's going to happen. It's definitely not going to happen, but you always have to prepare for everything. And that's what the Giants are doing right now. So that's really my whole take on it. We do have a super chat here from independent inside, inside outsider, <laughs> independent outsider. Thank you for the super chat. Two bucks there. We appreciate that. Are Giants riding with Locke in 2024? No, I don't think they are, but I do think there's a really strong chance that he plays in 2024 due to the injury clause in Daniel Jones's contract. If the Giants are not winning a whole lot of games this season, have a losing record going into the second half of the year, and Daniel Jones is still healthy, there's a chance that they sit him for contract reasons similar to what the Denver Broncos just did with Russell Wilson. There's a really good chance that he gets sat so that the future uh, – year in his contract doesn't get fully guaranteed and then we see drew lock but i don't think he'll be the week one starter yeah i mean right now if i was to look at the giant situation there's two ways this goes like this the way they draft the quarterback and then there's the path where they don't draft the quarterback and two of them are very 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 different for a lot of a lot of different reasons and um we'll talk about if they do draft a quarterback you obviously want that rookie to be playing i think you basically you go and you got drew lock for a reason and the reason is you don't need him to be starting. He doesn't even think he's going to be starting. So if you draft a rookie, Drew Locke doesn't care that the rookie is going to beat him. The writing's on the wall. You know, Daniel Jones will probably will not play another down for the Giants if they do end up drafting a quarterback. That's my personal opinion. If they don't draft the quarterback, I do see a world where, you know, Drew Locke maybe starts the first week or two of the season, depending on how fast Daniel Jones is rehabilitating. But I think that Jones will return and probably play in 2024 at some point if not most of the year and if he bounces back the thing is i just don't see how the money works long term even if he plays relatively well um i don't think he's going to trust his legs just yet and they're not going to want him to run the for at least for the first few weeks of the season they're going to be keeping him away from running the football because of the you know just the turf the hits you, you just don't want him to get injured again um i don't necessarily know i i kind of i don't know how you feel about this but I kind of feel like the Minnesota Vikings, there's so much buzz about them loving J.J. McCarthy. Um, there's connections to him. They're doing ridiculous amount of due diligence about him. Do you think right now that there's a chance J.J. McCarthy could go ahead of Drake May in this draft class? But we also haven't heard much about Jaden Downs. Everyone just assumes Jaden Downs is a lock at number two. But is there a world where Jaden Downs is the number three here? Like, do you, How do you kind of rank these guys at your, at, in your perspective? I know you like Drake May a little bit more than Jaden Downs, but like, from the league perspective and the buzz that we've heard, do you think there's a reality where Jaden falls to number three and then maybe could be QB four if someone like falls in love, like Minnesota trades up to three and loves JJ McCarthy? I don't think that Jaden Daniels gets past three, but I definitely think it's possible he gets past two. I don't think it's a lock that Drake May is going number two. That's just speculation. Uh, based on certain coaching connections, Jaden Daniels. People think that Jaden Daniels is going to go to number two um, to the Washington Commanders because they signed Marcus Mariota. And I think first and foremost, that's disrespectful to Drake May's athletic athletic ability. And also, this is not Marcus Mariota that came out of Oregon 10 years ago. Like This is an older version of him. He is not the athlete. This is not a guy who relates in his playing style any bit to Jaden Daniels. I don't know how everybody just kind of agreed that that was the assumption here after they signed Marcus Mariota, that that meant that they were going for Jaden Daniels. I, I disagree. I think that there's still a really strong chance that they go with Drake May, and we'll see whether or not that's the pick. I don't think we're going to know that until the night of the draft. Uh, so if Jaden Daniels is on the board at three, then it's a question of whether or not the Patriots like Jaden Daniels. Maybe they don't want a quarterback who has running as a big focal point of his uh, playing style. Then maybe they trade down or maybe they take J.J. McCarthy. I don't know. It's really tough to tell. We don't know who, what these teams draft boards look like. And again, it's the NFL draft. Anything can happen. But is there still a chance that Jaden Daniels is on the clock at, at, at uh, number three? Absolutely. I don't think that he's a lock for two. Uh, is there also a chance that Drake May is on the clock at three? Sure. Either one of those guys. It's really 50-50 what's going on here at the number two pick. I don't buy any of the you know, Jaden Daniels is a lock at two narrative. I think it's still 50 50 on whether it's Jaden Daniels or Drake May. And then after that, I mean, you got to find it pretty interesting what happens if the guy that the Patriots like gets taken at two and then they're picking at three. Do they trade down? Do they force it on the third guy? That's really the question of it. But really, kind of your other half of your question do I think that JJ McCarthy could be pick number three? Only in a trade scenario. I don't think we've heard nearly enough buzz about the Patriots being interested in J.J. McCarthy to feel like they could take him 
over one of Drake May or Jaden Daniels. I feel like we've heard a lot more connecting the Patriots to those two guys than J.J. McCarthy. We would have heard something by now, in my opinion, if they had J.J. McCarthy as one of their top three quarterbacks. I don't think there are many teams that, as a consensus in their draft room, have J.J. McCarthy as one of their top three quarterbacks. I'm sure that there might be one or two, but I don't think that it's a consensus around the league that a lot of teams have him in their top three. So realistically, I think that at four is where J.J. McCarthy could go if a team ends up trading up, but I don't think that the Patriots would go ahead and take him. It is possible, though. However, if the guy that the, the Patriots don't like is on the board at three, um, let's say they don't like Jaden Daniels as much as Drake May, Jaden Daniels is all they're left with, and then J.J. McCarthy, maybe the Vikings covet J.J. McCarthy over Jaden Daniels, trade up for him uh, at number three, and then, yeah, then you might have a, a situation where Jaden Daniels slides to six for the Giants, but Again, it's the draft. It's impossible to predict these things, and I don't think that anything like that is going to happen. I think really what we're expecting now, quarterbacks one, two, three, and then Vikings trade up to four for McCarthy. That's the most likely outcome. Keith Wilson with a super chat. We appreciate that. Salute, fellas. I know we think a wide receiver at six. I'm just worried we won't be able to double back in the second with quarterback. Also stacking wide receivers, maybe Brendan Rice. Yeah, Brendan Rice out of USC, player that the Giants were scouting today at the USC Pro Day. So I think that's interesting and something to take a note of. We'll see where he lands. Ultimately, I think he's probably a third or fourth round pick, but still someone who I think could be a good contributor in an NFL offense. And then in terms of going wide receiver at six, I'm not crazy about going quarterback at number 47. I think you're really settling at that point, and I don't think you're getting anybody who's going to be your long-term answer at the quarterback position without a significant amount of coaching and resources put into him. So going quarterback at 40, 47, personally, not my preference. It's quarterback or bust in the first round. If you're not taking one in round one, I think you're loading up on wide receiver at number six, and then you're loading up all the other holes on this roster because there are a damn lot of them in rounds two through seven. So that's kind of my take on that. Yeah, I, I'm not a big proponent of, of spending a second round pick on on a quarterback. It, it's just Michael Penix. I don't see it. I don't think he's going to be very good in the NFL. I think he'll be a probably a career backup. Um, I don't. I personally don't see it with Bo Nix. I don't think he's going in the first round. Maybe he gets into the first round if the team that's really needy wants to take a gamble. I could see the Giants taking a shot at Spencer Rattler in the third round, but that's about the maximum I could see them doing if they miss out on a quarterback here. But um, Keith Wilson, great last name. Um, appreciate the donation. Um, it's a uh, really generous of you, but yeah, I mean, a lot of the people in the chat it, guys, it, I think we're all in the same boat here. If you don't get a quarterback, the consolation prize of neighbors or, you know, Romo Dunze, or even if Marvin Harrison, and by the way, let's talk about that for a second. Marvin Harrison jr. Deciding to not only skip out on the combine, but also skip out on his pro day. I think that's probably a good move for him. Maybe some, maybe some people disagree. I think that he is the consensus. Number one, I think, that neighbors and is it's like one a one B like you could interchange both those guys. Um, I know you like neighbors a little bit more, but with, with what Marvin Harrison jr. Stock is right now, anything that he does in a pro day, anything he does in a combine is only going to hurt him. Right. Cause like he's already considered the top of the class. Why would you give anybody a reason to think of you in a different way? What if you don't have a good three cone? What if you, you know, run the 40 yard dash a little bit slower than you, than people thought you were suddenly you're the number two or three wide receiver. You leave it up to mystery, let them watch the game film. And that's all you need. I think him staying that, um, staying put, not actually going through the motions there is probably in his best interest, but for the giants, you know, we talked about a couple days ago on the, on the last live stream, the, the concept of moving back and, and taking the 11th overall pick and the 23rd overall pick from Minnesota. Imagine landing Brock Bowers and, you know, whoever you want, a cornerback at 23, or maybe even you go with A.D. Mitchell. You just overhaul your whole offense. You know what, Daniel Jones? We're not going to give up on you just yet. We're going to give you Brock Bowers, the best tight end prospect in the last generation, and we're going to give you A.D. Mitchell or Ladd McConkey, a guy who could be a bona fide number one. Um, you know, with a little bit more experience and then worst case, you move on from Daniel Jones and you have a sick young core of, of, of playmakers, Juan Dale, Brock Bowers and AD Mitchell, whoever you have at 23, maybe you just go crazy and retool the entire offense. Um, instead of just going for, uh, a neighbors or just going for an Odunze, you get a great, a great tight end. You cut Darren Waller, save the 7 million, sign a veteran cornerback. Speaking of cornerback, we'll transition to that for a moment here. The Giants signed Darnay Holmes to another uh, one-year contract today. Darnay has been benched multiple times with the Giants. 
never complained, always seems to be a, a pretty good guy. Like I like Darnay Holmes as a dude. He's just a he's a competitor. He's a leader. He's a good guy in the locker room. He doesn't get mad about getting caught about, about getting um, or losing his job rather. And ultimately, I think that right now he's a fine depth piece. You know, he can be a fine uh, slot option. He can play the outside. He's actually really good stopping the run, sniffing out screen passes. If there's anything Darnay Holmes is really good at, it's identifying stuff um, pre-snap. When it comes to post-snap and the guys are running routes against him, he gets a little bit of grabby sometimes. The Giants are also preparing to host Tredavious White on a visit this week. So there's definitely some buzz regarding that. Tredavious White has not played much football over the, la- over the last couple of years, had a couple of really bad injuries, but he's only 29 years old. Maybe you give him a very cheap deal and see if he can lock down CB2. You know, it's a fine gamble. Worst case, he gets injured in camp and you just cut him and, you know, you, you don't lose anything. Um, you know, because it's just cheap, cheap as hell anyway. You know, what are your thoughts about bringing Darnay back? And then the idea of Tredavious White. I know that Christian Fulton, I believe, was going to visit with the Chargers, if I'm not mistaken. I think I saw. So he might be going to another team already. Yeah, I think bringing in Trey White would be interesting. He's probably coming in on a very cheap deal for a one-year contract. And listen, there's a connection there. Uh, I think this is really the Giants saying, hey, let's see what's out there on the market. You know, let's visit with him, find out what his price tag is. And then if it's manageable, we'll try our best. But he's going to have a market. There's going to be a few teams that want him. And it's really going to be, does he still have a good connection with Joe Shane? Does Joe Shane want him? Does he like Joe Shane? That's probably what it'll come down to for Tredavious White. But I think one of the things that you could point to, the NFLPA uh, kind of survey or whatever that the Giants had, their training staff and all that stuff really like got all A's and everything. So that might be a selling point when they bring in a guy coming off of an injury like Trey White, why he might prefer the Giants to some other situations. Like I know oftentimes we talk about the Giants and we're like, oh man, who wants to come play for the Giants? The Giants are bad. Well, the NFL PA report says that guys love playing for the Giants. They love the facility. The food's good. The workout room is good. The training staff is good. All that stuff is good. So that's something that could be a selling point where if he brings in a guy like Trey White, Joe Shane does, brings in a guy to a meeting and says, hey, would you be interested in playing here? Know that we could help you a whole lot um, in terms of developing you, in terms of getting you back from that injury because of our traded staff. Take a look at our NFLPA ratings. That could be a reason why he would choose us. And again, I think that it's necessary to add more depth to the secondary. And Trey White, if he stays healthy, we know how good he can be. However, do we trust him to stay healthy? Not really. So you do need to continue, continue to add depth to this room. So there goes Darnay Holmes. More depth at cornerback. Darnay Holmes is more slot cornerback depth, which always has confused me because he never played slot cornerback in college. He was always an outside corner. And there are cornerbacks at his size who have succeeded on the outside in the NFL. So I don't really know why he was never given an opportunity through the past four years to try and play on the outside, but whatever. Now he's a slot cornerback and I like him in that role. I just think it would be interesting to see if they gave him another opportunity, but Holmes good depth piece. I know some Giants fans were like complaining that he was re-signed. Guys, it's a one-year deal on the veteran minimum. You got to go into training camp with 90 total players. Guys like Darnay Holmes, who you might not think so highly of, they're going to get signed. That doesn't mean they're going to be on the final 53-man roster, but they need bodies for training camp, for preseason, all that stuff. And honestly, I like what Darnay Holmes brings to this team. Furthermore, he did a lot on special teams last year, played a career high. 45% of the special team stats that the Giants played last year, Darnay Holmes was on the field. That's a big deal. They need to keep a lot of those guys, those core depth pieces on this roster so they could put out a special teams unit and he could be a part of that and he could add depth on the defensive side of the ball. Keep in mind, guys, he played only like 120 defensive snaps last year, somehow still ended up with two interceptions. He's got a nose for the football. He makes plays at times. Yeah, he grabs a little bit, gets those PIs. He's not the best in coverage, but he's still a decent depth player, like a good one, in fact, I think. I like Darnay Holmes. I think more highly of him than a lot of other people, I guess. But I think it's nice to see him come back to the Giants on a one-year deal. I think it's important for them to keep adding depth to this team. And signing Darnay Holmes doesn't prevent you from signing Trey White. Signing Darnay Holmes doesn't prevent you from drafting a Kamari Lasseter or any other cornerback in the second round. So the Giants are still in a good spot. They're just adding depth to this roster, and that is necessary. So LED asks any word on the Jermaine Illuminor pod. The word is it's coming soon. Alex knows a little bit more. I think that it's around OTAs is when it's happening. I just forgot the dates of OTAs, so I'll throw it over to Alex. 
Yeah, I think OTAs are next month, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but he said, uh, Jermaine said to me via DMs on Twitter that he wants to do it right before OTA. So we'll get that to you as soon as we can. Um, obviously, he's trying to get used to, they're probably sending him a whole bunch of stuff, maybe the playbook and whatnot to get used to. But fortunately, he's already very accustomed to Carmen Brasillo's, uh, you know, blocking scheme when he was with the Raiders. And guys, I think Jermaine Illuminor is going to be one of the most, I, I, it kind of gives me that Bobby Okereke vibe where Okereke is worth a lot more than $10 million per season based on his production last year. Um, I, I really think he could have that level of impact for us. We know Andrew Thomas is a stud left tackle. We haven't had a good right tackle. Honestly, Anthony, I can't even remember the last time we've had a good uh, right tackle. I, I literally cannot even think of a name. Um, that was actually competent, like Mike Remmers for like two games, like four years ago or five years ago. I legitimately cannot remember the last time. I actually think Jermaine Illuminor is going to be the best right tackle we've had maybe in eight, nine years. And we got him for an absolute bargain deal. And someone asked me yesterday, why was Jermaine Illuminor so affordable? Two years, uh, two years, $14 million. So $7 million per season, essentially only a one year deal. They can get after, get out of it after the first year. And he, by the way, he grew up in New Jersey. Great guy, wants to be a giant. If you guys have seen his social media accounts, all he does is like love to be a giant, can't wait to be a giant. We love that about him. Um, I kind of feel like maybe he's a scheme fit specifically for Basillo's offense, like his what he does. I think he's going to be a very solid run blocker for us. He's a very solid uh, pass protector, and he's just a great locker room presence. You know what I mean? Especially after losing Xavier McKinney and Saquon Barkley, two major leaders on this team. You love to bring in guys like Jermaine Illuminor, who is just a good personality, like a great guy to be around. They had to kind of usher in a new leadership. You know, uh, I'm curious to see what they kind of do about that. Who are going to be the leaders next year? Is there anyone that stands out to you, Anthony, that kind of you think could take on that role? Um, I think Deontay Banks might be someone who tries to take over a leadership role in the secondary. Um, I could see uh, Bobby O'Carrigan beating a captain next year again. Like I think that he's going to be a really big piece. Dexter Lawrence, Kayvon Thibodeau, maybe even Brian Burns is one of those guys that that develops that kind of aptitude and that persona that everyone just follows. Um, offensively, you lose Saquon Barkley. I don't think Devin Singletary is much of a leader. You really hope that Daniel Jones, whoever the hell's playing quarterback for us, is our is our leader. Like that's all you really care about. You go to the Chiefs, man. Patrick Mahomes is their freaking leader. You go to the Bills. Josh Allen is their freaking leader. But you go to the Giants and Daniel Jones isn't our leader. You know, Saquon Barkley's our leader. That's concerning to me a, a tiny bit. Um, I don't think that it's that big of a deal. Eli is, was never much of a leader in terms of his vocal capacity. But the difference was he led by example. He went out there and won football games. He won two Super Bowls. That's enough. Uh, that's enough juice to consider leadership, I think. Um, but is there anyone that you're looking to here that could be someone that steps into that role and really kind of takes over? It's still got to be Daniel Jones. I mean, he was a captain last year. We can't discount that fact. Like, the team does love him. Uh, all the players love Daniel Jones. Darius Slayton had money elsewhere. I think it was the Atlanta Falcons offered him a larger contract. He came back to continue playing with Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones is a leader. Like, I have plenty of criticisms of his ability to play on the football field. But who he is as a guy off the field and who he is as a leader, I do give him the credit. I think that he does those things really well as Alex sits in a cave while he's doing this live stream. <laughs> but I think that Daniel Jones has still got to be the leader, whether he's injured or not. Bobby Okereke is going to continue to ascend into that leadership role. Any other players, I could see Deontay Banks starting to take on a leadership role. But, I mean, it's kind of tough to tell in terms of who the veteran leaders are on this team right now after losing Saquon Barkley and Xavier McKinney. Those guys really were the lifeline of that locker room. That was your clear-cut leader on offense and on defense with those guys leaving there are some big shoes to fill in the giants locker room and ultimately i'm not sure how they're going to fill them but we will see uh it's going to be really interesting to find that once we do get the otas and training camp anthony thank you for the donation cool name i like it maybe we are better trade partners with than the vikings for qb at pick four being our sixth can still get mhj or neighbors at six vikings two picks are way higher up yeah, I think that for the Giants, um, being trade partners with the Vikings at number six might make sense for them, but that's only if the quarterback continues to fall down the board. It's really just the Vikings aren't going to trade to six unless they know for sure that the Giants don't want that quarterback. If they have any fears that the Giants might want that quarterback, which would be J.J. McCarthy, they're going to try to trade the four so that the Giants don't end up trading to four to take McCarthy instead of them because that's still a possibility. It might be a possibility where the Cardinals say, yeah, we want to trade down and get more picks, 
but we don't want to trade down out of the range of Romo Dunze, Malik Neighbors, or Marvin Harrison Jr. So we're only willing to go down to six. So then the Minnesota Vikings are going to be screwed because they're going to have already given up all this draft capital to get up to number 11 so that they could get up to four. And then all of a sudden the Cardinals are like, uh, no, thank you. We're only going down to six with the Giants. Giants give us, you know, a couple mid-round picks, maybe a, a third this year and a third next year, and we'll swap picks with you and you can take your quarterback. That's still a possibility for the Giants is that they move up to four rather than moving up to three. Moving up to three is going to be really expensive because you're trying to get after a Jada Daniels or a Drake May who are more highly valued around the league. But J.J. McCarthy moving up two spots for him might be a little bit cheaper and it might be a sweetener for the Cardinals because they're still going to land maybe the player that they wanted. Maybe they prefer Malik Neighbors and they know he's going to be there at six because they know MHJ is going five if they trade down. Then they're going to trade down to six because that's who they want and just take a couple mid-round picks in exchange. Then the Vikings are screwed, gave up all that draft capital, picking at 11, going to have to force it on a guy like a Bo Nix or Michael Penix, I guess. Sucks for them, but the Giants get their quarterback. So it's still possible. So I saw somebody else ask that earlier too. Could the Giants still trade up for a quarterback? They can. I don't think it's as likely anymore. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm settling into the reality that we're going to be taking a top of playmaker at number six. But yeah, I still think that it is possible. Um, and that would kind of be the way that I see it happening. I don't think that the Patriots are trading out of three, but trading up to number four, I, I could see it happening for a pretty cheap price. And then the Giants do get their quarterback. But I know that a lot of Giants fans wouldn't like that because giving up any assets to move up two spots when you could just sit there and take a blue chip prospect might not be a favorable option. But Alex, what are your thoughts on that? The Giants potentially trading up to four for a quarterback. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the truth is, man, if the Giants have a chance to go up to three, they're going to do it. If the Patriots decide that they want to move out of the third overall pick, the Giants are going to move up to number three. Why? Because now you have your choice of not just the top two quarterback, or not the top three, but the top four. You have the choice of whatever, whoever drops to three it could be Mayor Daniels and JJ McCarthy. So now you have the whole world ahead of you. You know, you now you have an idea. You, you just, I think it's, I think it's important to note that we people are afraid of drafting JJ McCarthy because he's the only option available, right? If you have Mayor Daniels and McCarthy, now you can take the highest one on your board. And I think that if if the Patriots are willing to move back, if they're willing to say we'll take the draft capital, but you got to, I mean, it's going to cost you a, a ton. It's either going to cost you forty seven, you know, six and then probably another second rounder next year, or it's going to cost you a first rounder next year, our sixth overall pick this year, and maybe another second round pick in the future, or our second round pick this year. You know, it, could be, it could cost you a lot. So I kind of feel right now um, you're mortgaging the future on a quarterback, but I've talked about this before. The financial benefits of getting a quarterback now will offset the, the risk of rolling with Daniel Jones. If you keep going with Daniel Jones, you're going to pay $40, $50 million a season. Whereas if you take that, you know, rookie quarterback, you have $30 million now to spend. And I just, I just think you can replace that first overall pick that you lose or a second overall pick that you lose in free agency next off season. And don't skip a beat. You can sign a really solid, I mean, you get Brian Burns for $30 million per season. I mean, I'd say he's probably more valuable than any pick, any, any defensive pick in the draft this year, because he's proven is a proven commodity. So, you know, you kind of get my logic there. But let's look at Patrick Clark and appreciate the donation, Anthony. Very, very generous of, generous of you. Patrick Clark says, what's your best case scenario for the draft round one and two? So people keep, keep, keep bringing us back to the draft here. We keep trying to get away, but you keep roping us back in. Um, and, and look, right now, the best case scenario for me is you land, we land the quarterback that Brian Dable feels like he can develop to be a superstar, right? That's the best case scenario, in my opinion. I imagine most people would agree with that. If we can get the quarterback that Joe Shane and Brian Dable think can be a superstar, that is what they need to do, and that is going to give us a very bright future. I mean, look what Mahomes just did. He had no receivers. All he had was a good tight end, a great tight end, Travis Kelsey, and he won a Super Bowl again. You know, didn't had nobody. Rashi Rice is, oh, is good, not great, not even close to great. So I kind of feel like if you're the Giants, now you have a rookie quarterback on the rookie deal, can spend the extra money to find a receiver in next year's free agency class, or you can maybe even keep your second round pick this year and get a really good player like Xavier Leggett. Um, there's some really good talent in the second round. This is one of the deepest, deepest draft class we've ever seen at the receiver position. Um, and another donation here from Connor Sash. Thank you very much, Connor. And I'll let you, Anthony, get, get your take on the, on the Patrick one as well. But he says, touchdown, TD cutter, P-Squad and stolen. DJ gone next year, lock on one-year deal. 
New York Giant needs to get a developmental quarterback by round three. If if a round one is a receiver, needs someone to go to in 2025 with under contract that isn't TD. Um, right now, I feel like if the Giants do go with the receiver in the first round, I'd be fine taking Spencer Rattler in the third. It's a developmental project. See where he can go. Can't hurt. But again, you know, if the Giants don't think Spencer Rattler has a future of being a starting quarterback in the league, it's not even worth touching him. You know what I mean? It's not even worth drafting him if they don't think he has that level of upside because you're wasting a quality third round pick that could be a Jalen Wright. You're wasting a, a, a maybe a Trey Benson or a Kalen Bullock. Like there's good players there in the third round who could start this year. So, Anthony, I'll let you get your take on Patrick's comments, but then also uh, Connor's as well. Yeah, best case scenario for the draft, the Giants land both a playmaker that they feel like can transcend their offense and a quarterback who can change the all the future of their franchise. So whether that be drafting a quarterback at six, whether it be trading up for one, they have to accomplish those two missions. They don't have a franchise quarterback right now, uh, long term with no health concerns. I'm going to clarify that. Maybe Daniel Jones is still their franchise quarterback, but he does have health concerns. They don't have a franchise quarterback without health concerns right now, and they do not have a thousand yard receiver. They haven't had a thousand yard receiver since 2018. They need to solve that problem. They need to do both of those things in this draft somehow. If they can't do one, they have to at least do the other. So the best case scenario, they address both of those needs. Worst case scenario, they address none of those needs. Somewhere in the middle, they address at least one of those needs. So either get the quarterback or the wide receiver. So that's really how it goes. And honestly, the Giants are in good position to do at least one of those two things. Doing both of them is going to be a challenge, but doing one of them is absolutely possible and more likely than not at this point. And then Connor's comment, again, appreciate the donation. Thank you very much. With Tommy DeVito being cut, going to the practice squad, whatever, listen, I think he lands on the Giants practice squad. I don't think he lasts on the Giants practice squad. Someone around the league midseason is going to have a quarterback injury and is going to sign Tommy DeVito to their active roster because they know that he could start games in a spot and probably win at least one or two of them if he has to start long term. I don't think that anybody's hoping to see him start long term. I don't think anybody's going to promise him anything long term. But as as of being a practice squad player, I do think that the Giants are at risk of losing him midseason just because he does have that ability to go out there and play. So if a team needs a quarterback who could suit up on a Sunday, they're probably going to try and go ahead and sign Tommy DeVito off of the practice squad. But with Tommy DeVito, I think there's also a chance that he stays under contract with the Giants if they're not able to land a quarterback in this draft. I think they're going to try and get one early, of course. But if they don't and they end up not taking one in the middle of the late rounds, you're probably talking about the three quarterbacks on your roster this season being Daniel Jones, Tommy DeVito, and Drew Locke, which is not ideal, but it is what it is. And so I don't think that the Giants are going to want Tommy DeVito to just leave, though. Uh, putting him on the practice squad, it's a risk. He could get stolen. But with Tommy DeVito, he is on their contract for multiple seasons, I believe. I don't think it's just this upcoming year. I think it's the following year as well. So you do have what you could consider to be a long-term backup. Plus, he knows the system, and he's loved by the fans. Keep in mind, that is kind of important. The Giants need some fan favorites. They need some players that the fans actually care about, because right now they don't have a whole lot. I mean, they brought in Brian Birds, and he'll probably pretty quickly become a fan favorite. Deontay Banks is becoming one. Kayvon Thibodeau is one. Dexter Lawrence. But, I mean, they did just lose Xavier McKinney, who was a fan favorite, and they lost Saquon Barkley, who was the fan favorite. So they need some fan favorite guys. And honestly, if you look back on that 2023 season, everybody's favorite player for at least a portion of a time, or at least the most popular player, it was Tommy DeVito. So it is important to me that the Giants, I think, keep him around, whether it's on the practice squad or whether they keep him on the active roster if they're not able to address quarterback in the drafts. I don't think that you should rule out Tommy DeVito being on this roster. Uh, but yeah, if they could definitely take a developmental quarterback in round three if it's a wide receiver in round one as well. There's a few guys out there. There's Pratt, there's Rattler. There's going to be some guys. Uh, we'll see how far guys like Penix and Bo Nix end up sliding. Uh, sometimes we get shocked and players fall a lot further than you expect, but I could totally see them bringing in another quarterback. But again, I wouldn't discount the ability of Tommy DeVito to actually be on this roster uh, this upcoming season. I think that could be interesting. Now, Adam asks a pretty interesting question here. Can we talk about the possibility of Marvin Harrison G Jr.? Seems it's feasible at the draft could go quarterback, 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 neighbors, and then, of course, Marvin Harrison Jr. at six. And honestly, we haven't really talked about Marvin Harrison Jr. much on this channel, Alex, because we're not expecting him to fall to six. So I guess now is a pretty good time to at least touch on him. Listen, Marvin Harrison Jr. is a game changer. He brings size. He's a great refined route runner. I mean, he's an elite prospect. If the Giants do land him, what can you expect? You could expect every social media graphic from every outlet to say Giants won the draft tonight. They got an A+. 
they somehow landed the draft's arguably best player in the whole class. It's all true. So Marvin Harrison Jr. would change this offense. He would give the Giants that thousand yard receiving threat. You know, whether or not he goes for a thousand yards as a rookie, I think is pretty dependent on the quarterback play. But he is a thousand yard receiver in this league as long as he's in the right situation. And again, situation is everything for every prospect. But Marvin Harrison Jr. would be sick. Like we would be jumping for joy if that happened for sure. And we will be live on the night of the draft. So if it is Marvin Harrison Jr., we're going to be excited. We're going to be yelling. We're going to be praising Joe Shane. It'll be fun. He's really one of those prospects to me, Marvin Harrison Jr., that feels very can't miss. Like his game is so well suited to the NFL, his playing style. It's going to translate. I think he's going to be an excellent pro. And if he is a New York Giant, yeah, I'll definitely be thrilled about it. I just don't see what team is passing on him. You know what I mean? Even if you're the Cardinals, right, and you have Kyler Murray, and you are you think you can win and build something around Kyler, you're going to pass on Marvin Harrison Jr. to trade back to 11? You know what I mean? Like you're, you're going to be passing on Odunze, neighbors, and Marvin Harrison Jr., not just one of them, all of them. I don't just to get the 23rd overall pick, right? Is it worth it? Um, it's a gamble, man. Unless I think the only way the Cardinals are moving back personally from and passing on Marvin Harrison Jr., the only way they're moving back is if they can take that draft capital and move back up. You know what I mean? Like they're going to move back to 11 and then move back up with the Giants or something like that. And not give us, I just don't know how you pass I'm on it. I disagree on that because I think that if they get a future first round pick in addition to the other two first round picks, you're talking three first round picks. I think that they could look at it and say, hey, so? our roster sucks. I think that they should get a future first round pick in that deal. I do. And, the, and I, so you think they could get the 11, 23, 23 and, and they should the get two thousand. They should. I mean, crap. If they get that much, then yeah, I would probably move back if I were them. <laughs> but that's the thing. That's the only, like, if you're picking at four, you have the opportunity for Marvin Harrison Jr. You need that in order to trade off of him. So like yeah. to your point where I don't see how a team could pass up on him for three first round picks, you could see it. So I could see it happening. Receiver? I could see it where, where he falls. So I, I mean, but listen, it's not going to be easy for a team to convince uh, Arizona to trade out of that spot. But again, that Chargers. team sucks. The, the the Cardinals are terrible. Like that that team has no talent, really. I mean, they have Kyler Murray. They, their wide receiver core was decimated. So that's why Marvin Harrison Jr. is like the obvious no brainer pick for them. But honestly, they they are lacking talent across the board: offensive line, defensive line, secondary, everywhere. They they're one of the teams more than anybody that probably should be trading down, accumulating extra draft picks, and especially if they can get future draft picks. So. I think that it's not out of the realm of possibility for Marvin Harrison Jr. to make it past four, which is about then you get to five. Nobody's really going to be trying to trade up to five at that point for the L.A. Chargers if someone trades up to four. Mm -hmm. So he's probably going to Los Angeles, who, again, has like nobody on their contract to receive other than Quentin Johnston and like one other guy. Yeah, I mean, hey, man, maybe maybe we uh, trade with the uh, Cardinals and we give them a first round pick just to take Daniel Jones and we'll get Kyler Murray. Just swap that. Just swap contracts. They get a first round pick. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting crazy here but man I, I honestly cardinals are in a weird spot they need a lot but again like passing on a surefire receiver like top receiver tough tough to do tough to stomach but my maybe kyler murray and brock bowers would be a pretty damn good combination who knows um if you're the giants though there's a world where we have odunze and that's it right if you're maybe odunze is the only guy there um at at six you know maybe they maybe the cardinals take marvin harrison jr and the chargers say we're not moving back we want malik neighbors and the giants say well jg mccarthy's on the board at six and you know we have odunze here too what do you do maybe if that's the scenario and you don't like um if you don't like uh, you know jj mccarthy that much do you stick and pick odunze or do you move back at 11 and get i mean personally if, if it's between odunze and getting brock bowers and the 23rd overall pick I'm trading back. Um, I like Odunze a lot, but I really like Brock Bowers a lot. I think he's going to be a monster. What would you do in that scenario? Would you take Odunze or would you trade back at Brock Bowers at 23? It's Brock Bowers at 11, not 23. Yeah, at 11, at 11, at 11. I think it's, uh, it's tough, right? It's a it's tough, tough one. But... It's not Well, it's not tough for me because of Brock Bowers. Um, it's tough for Brock. me because I, I would assume, again, if it's a trade for a quarterback at six, if Minnesota's going up for a quarterback at six, I'm telling them I'm not moving off of this pick unless you give me that first round pick next year. And I'm probably going to get it he because they need, they need their quarterback. So I need three firsts. And if they cough up three firsts, <sighs> all right, so maybe they say no to that. They negotiate a little further. Okay, at least I can get a second or third round pick next year. Sweeten it. There's a good yeah. chance. 
it's really more about the amount of picks for me. It's not necessarily the fact that I could still get Brock Bowers because Brock Bowers might go at like nine or, you know, 10. I mean, at 10 for the Jets, like he's very possibly going number 10 to the Jets and you're picking mm-hmm. at 11 now. So you can't guarantee that you're getting Brock Bowers there. So They're it's not a that. Tackle. They might get a tackle. Well, they got Tyrone Smith and Mark they don't, Moses. They don't necessarily but... need a tackle anymore. The Jets are wide open to do whatever they want. And they, they got Mike Williams Brock Bowers. and Garrett Wilson. They have and, and, so and, and. much talent now on that roster. I actually can't believe how good that Jets roster is right now. If they stay healthy, they should be contending. For Super Someone called me so crazy for saying they were a top 10 team recently. And I'm like, you're you're insane. Their offense with Aaron Rodgers and all that talent. If they just play, if they just play to their potential, they're not. A, they're not only a playoff team. They're one of the few teams that could beat the the the, the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Yeah. One of the few teams. Their defense if is the, crazy. Yeah. If the Jets stay healthy, like that team is really good. Defense is stacked. They got talent all across the board. Yeah, they lost a couple pieces, but then they just added all that, all the money that they lost from those pieces. They just threw right into the offense, and their offense should be like night and day difference next year, especially if Aaron Rodgers stays healthy and is under center. So I turned into a Jets segment for two seconds there, but that team is really good, and that's why they are wide open to do whatever they want at 10. They can take a Bowers. They could take uh, a tackle, too, because the guys that they signed are veterans, so they could get someone younger in the mix. They can go defense. They could do really anything, which is why trading to 11 is not actually the most desirable spot if you're the Giants, because you have a team there at 10 that's a complete wild card and could take one of your players that you want there, uh, whoever you want, and just kind of steal that from you after you traded down and gave up the player that you wanted at six. But I guess to get back to your original question, I think I'd take Romo Dunze. I think I would just take the surefire player. I'm I'm still really high on a Dunze. But yes, I would have to really sit and think about it, maybe take a vote in the room if I were Joe Shane and see how everybody feels and also see if I can get future draft capital out of it because I think that's really important. Uh, we do have a super chat here from Dennis Schumar 11. Thank you for the super chat. Four games of the five without Andrew Thomas with the worst offensive line in the NFL versus stout playoff teams. Bottom three wide receiver core races all 2022 Daniel Jones's improvements. Daniel Jones showed a lot of progress in 2022. Uh, but he also showed a lot of progress for an offense that was still middle of the road. The Giants did not have a top five or a top 10 or even top 15 unit. I believe they ranked around 16 or 17. So yeah, a lot of improvement from Daniel Jones last year, and he still did not have this team as a top 10 offense. So I think that's worth noting. Uh, I'm not saying that the 2023 season, this five or six games that he played, whatever, completely erase what he did in 2022 i will always appreciate and respect what he did in 22 giants won a playoff game for the first time in over a decade that was awesome obviously i was rooting for daniel jones i was calling him a franchise quarterback when he did that but yeah this past season it was tough and it's really the injury it's the fact that he has that injury clause in his really expensive contract he has two neck injuries and an acl tear that would be what erases his improvements because first of all it's hard to get back from those things so it might physically erase his improvements Like it might actually affect him and he might not return to form. And also it just creates too much uncertainty around his future to continue to bank on him at that contract. So that's what it is. It's not about, you know, he didn't play well versus some good teams with a bad line last year. It's just that he has so many injuries now piled up on him that you can't bank on your future with Daniel Jones for me personally. Alex, we have another super chat I want to get to as well, but I don't know if you do have any thoughts on this take as well. My thoughts are it's just it's just too little too late. You know what I mean? If this was year two or three, I'd be right there with you, Dennis, and saying that, yeah, we just gave him bad scenarios. Let's give him another shot. But right now it's year six. You know, it's year six. He's had two neck injuries, one of them very serious that required surgery. He's had a torn ACL, bad habits. He can't read the field well. They've never had an offense that absolute that allowed him to actually develop and grow. And it's unfortunate. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's just too little too late. We've never like we've been having the same conversation for for the better part of three, four years now. Like, when is it gonna be time to just hit the reset button? You know what I mean? It's like it's like you have an old car. You are let's say you buy a new car, and five years later, you're like, Yeah, you know what? This car's not it's not really performing the way I thought it would. And we didn't put the right tires on it. We didn't have it doesn't have the right engine, doesn't have all the specifications we need. But we still want to give it another chance. We still want to give it another chance. Let's put premium gas in it this time. You know what I mean? But it's it's too little too late. The car's already beat up. The car's already done. The wheels are are, are fried. The engine's gassed. You know, it's just – it's a beat up old car now. It's like a 1980 Toyota Camry at this point in time. That's kind of the, the concern that I have. Um, it's just too little too late. He's, he's taken too many hits. Um, and, and it sucks because we kind of did it to him, um, you know, but Ryan Davis, I'll address this. He can't read the field well. I'm not a fan of the statement. Are you in the huddle? Do you know the progressions are? What was he coached to do? There is a clip 
that you can find on Twitter that is the example of this. It's on the goal line. He's on the one yard line. He takes the snap, stares down the receiver, and the, the slot cornerback simply steps in front of him. I think it was last season, beginning of the year, or maybe it was the year before that, and just takes it to the house. You know what I mean? It was against stares the Seahawks in week three. It was, against, it was against the Seahawks in week three. Corner steps in front. He's staring down the receiver. I mean, he's not going yeah. through his progression. And, and Waller was right behind him wide freaking open. Yes, and it was after <laughs> that game that that rookie cornerback who made that play said the whole game we knew where he was throwing every time because he doesn't read the field well and he was staring down his read. So it's not yeah. like it's just our opinion saying this. We're saying like there's other NFL players yeah. who are calling out Daniel Jones for not reading the field well more so than anything. So I think that he reads the field okay could be a whole lot better though and that's why i'm willing to roll the dice on another quarterback prospect take the gamble and see if this guy does read the field better than daniel Mm -hmm. jones but connor with another super chat really do appreciate this one this one's a hefty one so thank you so much rattler high completion percentage while pressured half the time makes plays in and out of structure made a bad team competitive behind the worst offensive line in the sec on a better team he would be seen as qb4 humbled with no character issues for the last two years Everything you said there is factual. He had a high completion percentage. He was pressured half of his stats. I think the actual number is about 40% of the time, 38.9 or something like that. He was pressured quite a bit, like a disgusting amount. I felt really bad for him watching his film. He does make plays in structure. Out of structure, I don't think he's that great. He's okay. Uh, He just had to do it a whole lot more. So his sample size is larger of ugly plays because he was under pressure so much. So I think that's to his credit. Made a bad team competitive behind the worst offensive line in the SEC. That is true, 100%. Uh, On a better team, would he be seen as QB4? Quite possibly. I think that if he was playing behind Washington's offensive line and throwing to Romo Dunze, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk, absolutely. I think there's a good chance that we're talking about Spencer Rattler as QB4. But unfortunately... That's not the world we live in. He was playing for a really bad South Carolina team. Yeah, he had Xavier Leggett. He didn't have a whole lot of talent outside of that. And listen, it's just a bad roll of the dice for Spencer Rattler. The career that he had in college didn't go the way it was supposed to. I mean, this kid should have been a number one overall pick, but there's also more to it. He's very undersized. Uh, His arm is not the strongest. So I see why he's not considered QB4. You know, I mean, he. I think he came in at what, like six foot? Like he came in pretty small at the combine and he didn't weigh a whole lot either. His hands weren't very big. So like from a size standpoint, there are question marks, Uh production standpoint, there's definitely question marks, but again, you can attribute a lot of that to the situation that he was in, but then really just furthermore, I, I think that his arm talent is not there with these other guys. Like JJ McCarthy throws a freaking laser, whether you like him or not, he throws a pretty fast ball. Michael Penix Jr. has an absolute nuclear cannon on his shoulder. Like he throws the ball with an incredible velocity. Uh, you got guys like obviously Caleb Williams, Drake May. So Spencer Rattler doesn't have that to me and to a lot of people. So that's kind of where you talk about his tools and his traits. They're not as impressive as some of these other quarterbacks. So that's probably why he's not QB4. But then again, maybe in a better situation, his tools and traits would have looked better. It's totally possible. Uh, But Alex, how do you feel about Spencer Rattler? Kind of all the stuff that Connor mentioned here. There's definitely some pros, but I think personally, when you dig a little bit deeper on Rattler, there's definitely some cons to his game as well. Yeah, I mean, look, Rattler, he had the worst offensive line in college football, right? So, you know, it kind of fits the mold for the Giants who had the worst offensive line in professional football. Um, He knows what it's like to struggle. You know, J.J. McCarthy's had a pretty good situation at Michigan. Drake May did not so much. UNC's offensive line was pretty bad. USC, Kayla Williams was really bad, the offensive line. Um, And then Jaden Daniels had a very good offensive line. So, you know, you see differences here. Spencer Rattler, what I do like about him is kind of what you said, Connor, in that he's had some adversity already. He's overcome some adversity, and he's played in a system that, you know, was not very good offensively because of the line. And then he also managed to maximize Xavier Leggett, who, you know, that's one of Anthony's top top prospects of the receiver position. So, you know, I kind of feel as though maybe there is something there. Maybe there is a, a future for Rattler as a starter. But if I'm the Giants and I spend a third round pick on him, I have to be 100% sure that he could develop into that because there's other really, really, this is one of the deepest draft classes we've had in a long time. I feel like that third round pick could be an instant starter for at some positions. And the Giants risking that, throwing that pick away for a guy that's not going to have that upside is just, is just a dumb gamble to me. Um, but I'm not the one you know, making that decision. I think he could have that upside. He's shown flashes of it. He's got a really solid arm. He can move. He's not that bad of an athlete. 
Um, I wonder if there's more to his game that meets the eye. But again, he's he's not, I wouldn't say he's elite in any traits, right? I, I would, and that's the thing about like third round picks, like or like mid-round picks. And guys, I, I like to find guys that have at least one elite trait. You know what I mean? Like Trey Benson, for example, he could be there potentially at the top of the third round. Um, and he is has he has elite contact balance. Jalen Wright, elite top end speed. You know, there are guys that have elite traits, and that's kind of what I'm looking for in those mid-round uh draft selections. Spencer Rattler doesn't have any elite traits to me. And that's a little bit of a concern. But again, like neither does Brock Purdy. Like he doesn't have any elite traits. Um, you know, maybe his maybe his processing is elite, you could say. Um, that would probably be like the claim that most people would make. But, you know, it, it, I guess maybe Tom Brady didn't have any elite traits coming out of college, but he became the best of all time. So maybe it just takes another a good coach. Maybe it just takes a good scenario to get the best out of somebody. Um, so if the Giants did take Rattler in the third round, I wouldn't be upset. I mean, they think they see something in him. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't go in that direction unless they felt pretty confident about it. Yeah, Rattler essentially is a guy that you take a flyer on. Like, that's the player that you take in round three if you need someone with developmental upside and hope that he, because he was in such a bad situation, his talent was not displayed properly and there's more for you to unlock. That's what you're hoping for there. I don't necessarily think that he's got otherworldly potential. I don't think that he's going to be a bust. With Rattler, it's really just about getting into the right situation. And are the Giants the right situation? You might argue yes, because Brian Dable's a good quarterbacks coach. You might argue no, because, you know, not a whole ton of talent around there. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes with Spencer Rattler. He's definitely a guy that I think I'm higher on than a lot of people, but also maybe not. He's kind of like one of those players that is just kind of 50-50 for a lot of guys. Some guys really like him. Some guys really don't. Um, and I could see it going both ways, why he would succeed and why he wouldn't. Am I opposed to a Jordan Travis or a Joe Milton? Jordan Travis, again, shout out to the Palm Beach Gardens native. I really like him, but he's probably not even getting drafted. Maybe he does, but it's definitely on day three. Jordan Travis, Joe Milton, those guys need a lot of work and development. Like Those are not guys that I think step in and have success right away. So I'm not opposed to it. I just wouldn't get your hopes up if they end up drafting a guy like that. But Alex... No, we're about to wrap up here. Anything else that you want to share with the fans? I do want to drop this link into the chat right now, guys. This is the Discord to Fireside Bets. Fireside Bets is on a win streak right now. I know Alex has a little bit more info that he wants to share with you about that, but go ahead. Join us in the Discord chat with us about some Fireside Bets uh, and really any bets that and anything in the betting world that you want to talk about in that Discord. Yeah, yeah, we're doing pretty well over at Fireside Betting. We're three for our last four. A couple days ago, we had a 3-0 and day on the NBA Parlay. So doing really good stuff over there and dropping NBA Parlays every single day. We're doing tons of research, looking up so much. I'm spending hours trying to find the best lines and best uh, bets to parlay together. Um, so if you're interested in those types of things, if you're into sports betting, it's not going to just be NBA. We're going to do MLB if you're into baseball. Um, for the Yankees, we do some Yankee parlays. And then when the football season comes around, hopefully we have some people to bet on for the Giants because it's been pretty slim uh, pickings the last couple of years. Really, I've been looking at Wandale Robinson receptions every week as my primary bets that are related to the Giants. But if you guys are interested um, in the betting stuff, you can definitely go to the Discord and join there, and we drop our links every single day with reasons and, and blurbs about all the re why, all the reasons why we chose those bets and um, so much good information and good conversation. Obviously, we're going to do some really cool stuff for the fans in the chat where you guys will do ladder challenges so you guys can drop your ladders and we'll follow every single person all along. Maybe we'll do some um, March Madness stuff too. I know, Ryan, you just said Montana Saint, a State Moneyline Parlay with Boise State. Lock it in. We'll do some. We'll do some of that, those, um, you know, March Madness parlays and money line stuff. So if you want to join the Discord, we'd love to get your take on that as well, and we can discuss those. And um, maybe we'll maybe we'll tail those with the fans and stuff. But yeah, Anthony, I'll let you send us off. Yeah, it'll be fun. I do want to kind of hit on a few of these last minute rapid fire questions. This one I saw Steven drop this into the chat a few times, so I will address it. Mock trade where Minnesota sends pick number eleven, Jordan Addison, and the 2025 second round pick. I don't think that's possible. I don't think they're moving on from Jordan Addison. I know why you would say that because they do have to pay Justin Jefferson. They have him. I think that they're sticking with Addison. The 2025 second would be sick. This would take a lot of consideration, but I probably would say no thank you because even still, yeah, the Giants are moving down to 11, get a future second. Yeah, they've got Jordan Addison, so they've got a good receiver who could potentially go for 1,000 yards uh, one season in the future, you know, all that stuff, but still don't have quarterback solved. So I'm stop, probably just picking at six, getting a guy at receiver who has a fresh rookie contract or hopefully landing myself a quarterback. So 
Probably not taking this deal. Might surprise you. It's an interesting deal, though, and worth a lot of uh, consideration. And then the last thing, know you're happy, but wanted to know thoughts on CB2 being a CJ Henderson. Totally possible. Listen, there's so many guys out there right now on the cornerback market. It's just not a lot of them are massive upgrades. They're not a lot of stabilizing players who fix your secondary. So it could be a CJ Henderson. It could be an Adoree Jackson. It could be a Trey White. Kind of all these guys are in the same mix. Christian Fulton. They're all just guys who are veterans and are probably just stopgap players for the year. I like C.J. Henderson. I like any of these guys. Like It's pretty much just what the market is at this point. It's not chock full of talent, and the Giants don't have money to sign top talent anyway. But yeah, I wanted to just answer those questions real quick before we signed off. But again, guys, thank you so much for being here and tuning into this live stream. You've been showing a ton of support on the live streams. We do want to make Wednesday nights a regular thing. So we're thinking of doing Wednesdays at 4.30. Every single Wednesday we'll be here. We're, of course, going to continue to live stream on other nights as well. We've been kind of doing them random lately. Like, okay, we're going live at 3 on, you know, Friday or 5 on Wednesday. Like, it doesn't matter. We've just been kind of doing them. And we're still going to do that. And, of course, upload our regular pre-recorded episodes. But Wednesday nights, you could definitely count on us being live. That's going to be our new plan, at least leading up into the NFL draft. We're going to do that for the next few weeks. So stay tuned to that and stay tuned to the channel because we have so much great content cooking. Of course, the 20K special soon. We're very close to 20K subs. So thank you guys again for all the love and support. And I guess we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. So make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this live stream. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode or a live stream. Uh, comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. And go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we will catch you on the next one. Have a good one. And let's go Giants.